what you should and shouldn't include in your event contracts. That's what we're talking about today on Event Planning Blueprint TV. Hey event planners, welcome back to Event Planning Blueprint TV. My guest today is Annette Stepanian, who is a lawyer for creative entrepreneurs. And what Annette does is she helps you grow and build your business. So welcome to the show, Annette. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited. I am as well. So I'm just going to turn it over to Annette quickly so she can give you a little bit more about um, her story and her background, and then we'll get into the interview. Thanks. Yeah. So as you mentioned, Melanie, I'm an attorney for creative entrepreneurs and I work with um, different business owners across different um, business fields just to help them kind of digest the law a little bit and get them set up so it's not so scary and they can go back to doing what they love to do, which is running business. Um, I, my experience is I practice law in a national law firm for five years and I was living the dream, but I just was not fulfilled. Um, it's kind of a common story for most attorneys. Uh, so I took a leap of faith and I left my job and I started my creative business, a jewelry line, and just fell completely in love with this community of small business owners, creatives, and a lot of people kept coming to me for my legal advice. So I thought, hey, this is kind of a nice niche. I can combine my legal background with my love of creatives and small uh, so now I've merged the two and this is what I do. Amazing. I love it. And we have some of your, um, your tools, your contracts on our website, Event Planning Blueprint. And we're going to talk specifically about event planning today, um, even though I know you encompass all creative businesses. And event planning is definitely a creative business. Um, so let's just start yes. with, you know, like what are some of the key issues that you hear over and over again? Things like maybe, you know, how do I get paid? How do I make sure I get <laughs> That's a paid? big thing across any business. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a big thing across any business. Um, I think, of course, I think having a contract is definitely a step in that direction. Um, okay, you want to make sure you have something in writing that binds not only you, but your client. So um, that's the first step. And I think most people get that. Uh, but in terms of what you put into your contract, you want to... One of the reasons why I love contracts is because it clarifies the party's expectations. It's a vehicle in which you can communicate to your client, hey, this is how I operate, this is when I expect to get paid, this is how things work. And I think it's important for you as a learner to think through those things. And as you proceed in your business and you learn about, you know, I'm coming across this pitfall, you can tweak your contract to um, kind of circumvent those issues. But in terms of making sure you get paid, obviously you want to have your your payment terms in your contract. One thing I see a lot of event planners do, which I like to suggest a different approach. Um, most commonly, event planners will take a deposit initially upon signing of the contract, and then they'll take the remainder maybe two weeks before the event. And so there's this huge gap in between um, when they're doing all this work and they're not getting paid. Mm -hmm. And so what I like to recommend is to see if you can divide your work process into different phases and milestones. So for instance, let's say there's the first phase is finding vendors or finding venues and booking them. And the second phase is maybe doing all the logistics related to styling and organizing the event. And then the third phase is actually running the event. So what I would recommend is if you can tie your payment terms to each to, to each project milestone. So let's say at the end of, after you guys have done your venue search and booking, you get paid. And then on, only then do you continue to the next phase. So that's one way to not leave it until the and here you're doing all this work and not getting paid. I love that. That's a great strategy for um, any entrepreneur, but especially in event planning, because it always is a concern. And, you know, it's it's common, unfortunately, that people do run up against this where they're not getting paid or they're not getting paid on time or they're worried about it. And so what a great um, way to set, like you said, those milestones and, you know, four of them, if those are your categories that Annette just mentioned, uh, makes it really simple and really simple to lay out in your contracts as well. Yeah, so that's great. And um, who should, yeah. so let's just, you mentioned the contract. So let's just talk about those for a little bit because I know they're always, there's always a concern around them. Like what should I have in my contract? Um, who should, 
sign it, you know, say for example, you're planning a wedding and the parents are paying for that wedding, but it's your wedding and you're the one organizing it along with the event planner. Like, who do you get to sign the contract? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I know, that's a great question. Um, so, so there's this concept in, um, in at least, you know, common law, it's called privity of contract. So basically it says that your responsibilities and the duties that are owed are to the parties of to the contract. And you can't bind somebody or impose obligations on somebody who is not a party to a contract. So this is kind of a tricky question because if you, if you want, um, if let's say you enter into a contract with a parent, let's say who is paying for someone's wedding, for instance, um, they are technically your client. So you owe all of your responsibilities to the parent, which might be, you know, create issues with the bride and groom. <laughs> so you have to um, think about who is your client, who do you want to report to essentially and be responsible to. So most people I would recommend that if let's say the wedding you do it's your this and groom and it's the bride and groom's responsibility to make sure that you get paid. So whether that's coming from their own pockets or somebody else's pocket, um, your rights and obligations and duties are owed to the bride and groom and vice versa. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. And then I guess uh, it's up to the event planner to kind of manage that relationship. You, you, you have to anyway, whether yes. it's a bride and groom and the parents or it's, you know, maybe someone in HR and the CEO and the CEO is paying and that's a lot of, it's a lot of managing. And so what are some best practices for event planners either around the contracts or even managing those relationships so that they do get paid on time and they don't have to worry about any of the things that come along with, um, with, uh, what is the, what's the word I'm looking for here with, well, I'll cut this part cause I'm stumbling a little too much, but, um, what, do, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, it's breaking up a little bit, but it is. I know. Don't worry, it, it is breaking up. I don't know if you're getting it. I am. Yeah, and the thing is, what I do is I actually transcribe them anyway, so I'm not too worried about it. But and sometimes when it's um, when it's recorded, it's not as bad as what it seems like for us. Okay, great. Yeah, I so just, that's why yeah. I kind of just go with it because I never really know until I look at the video. Um, but it, no it's, problem. It's fine. It's it is breaking up a little, but I can still make up what you're saying. So, um, anyway, okay. so let's just go back. Uh, what were we yeah. just talking about? You had just made a point. Um, so what are some like, like relationship, like, like issues, like, like how you can manage that relationship or yeah. Okay. to make sure you get paid on time? Yeah. Okay, oh. great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> this happens sometimes. Oh my um, God. It's totally fine. <laughs> that's why I love recording. <laughs> yes. I, I was just going to say, thank God for that. We're not like live, but yeah, even then, if even it's, then I just, yeah, you just go it's with real. It. <laughs> Um, so Annette, just share with us because there's a lot of managing of relationships that go on and, you know, the contracts give you that legal binding piece of paper, but you still have to either manage your relationship, you know, as an event planner, manage your relationship with the bride and groom and the parents, especially if the parents are paying and they're the ones who sign the contracts but it's really the bride and groom's dreams that you're fulfilling. Um, or even if you're a corporate event planner doing fundraising, there may you may run into a similar issue where someone else is paying for it and you're dealing with um, you know, maybe an assistant or someone in HR or another employee. So how do you kind of, what, do you have any suggestions or best practices for event planners and how to deal with that and, and then how it relates specifically to contracts? In terms of um, managing a relationship, I think it's true of any relationship. It's about communication and it's about being really clear about what you are and what you're providing and what you aren't providing. Mm -hmm. And what, again, what your expectations are and what the client's expectations are. And that's something that I think should be done initially before you enter into a contract. But then when you do enter into a contract, all those things are outlined. So you put in your um, you know, services to be formed. What I recommend is get really specific and just say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm not doing. I mean, even down to I expect you know, um, a meal for my, me and my, um, uh, my assistants at the event. You know, you want to get that all very clear so there are no surprises and issues later on. Um, in terms of payment, I think it's really important to get a system in place where you can timely follow up with people um, and invoice them on a regular basis because, one, it 
stopped you from losing out and kind of um, missing invoices. But then also it communicates to the other person that this is a business and you treat it seriously. And that let's say you have a late fee in your contract that says that if you don't pay on time, I don't know, I charge a $25 late fee for every day it's late. Like you want to be on top of those things so that people treat you with that kind of professionalism that you are um, portraying and expecting to be treated with. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point. And, um, you know, I've had a number of friends who I've hired for different services and they've always given me a contract, which sometimes feels weird when you're doing it, you know, with family or friends. But at the same time, it definitely held us to a schedule um, and there was accountability there. So I agree, you know, whether it's friends or family or you're planning events for as a professional for um, for clients, you need to get everything in writing. And even just like you said, down to that last detail. So I'm just going to throw out a scenario here and let me know um, kind of, you know, your thoughts on this because I, I see this coming up or I hear about this a lot where, you know, there's um, an event planner who planned the event, they did everything that they were contracted to do and then at the last minute the um, client is unhappy, you know, and, mm -hmm. and this goes, this happens in, in many types of events. It doesn't really matter what kind of events you plan um, and then they want a refund. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So they have, they want a refund at the last minute because they weren't happy with something that happened maybe right at the event or leading up to the event. How would you deal with that in terms of writing it into your contract? Well, that's or interesting. Training? Yeah. Um, can you? Maybe you I can't guess... and maybe it depends on the state or where you live, but. Yeah. I mean, you could include a refund policy that under what conditions, you know, are refunds allowed, you know, and it could be something like if maybe you physically weren't able to be there. Um, but in terms of like, you know, you want to minimize the, the, how subjective those standards are going to be. So it's like, okay, if I didn't perform it to your expectation or I didn't perform it to um, a, a level or a standard of X. It should be, you know, did I show up on, you know, did I show up? Did I say that, you know, I was going to have the vendors all organized? I was going to have the table set. I was going to have, you know, the programs out, whatever, like all those things that I perform all of those things. And if the answer is yes, you did perform those things, then, then you've completed your part of the, of the contract. Um, but in terms of a refund policy, I mean, I, I, I guess you could, if there's certain things that if to a reasonable person, you would think that that would warrant a refund, you know, um, people didn't show up, people were, you know, four hours late to the event, people, just things that like, just negate the reason why you would even be there or, or prevent you from performing the services you promised to do. I think then that's, you can include a refund policy or something like that to that effect. Yeah, I that, agree. Yeah. And it was, does that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, it does make sense. And I think having a refund policy is, is a good backup. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to follow it because I think, you know, you said it, it's subjective and communication is really key. And also just trusting that, you know what, if you made, if you messed up and they're not happy, then you know, you kind of have to manage that relationship and think about it long term rather than just what's in your contract. I think it's a good thing to have in your contract just as a backup um, and uh -huh. it does make it clear, but you're right. It is, it's a subjective question and I just, I, it comes up a lot. So I wanted to just get your advice on that. Yeah. And, and I think it's also important to um, disclaim any responsibility for other vendors' performance. So if, you know, they hire a florist, for instance, and I don't know, they bring out red roses instead of white roses. Um, that's, that was, that's not your responsibility. That's, that's an issue that they have with that vendor. Um, and so kind of clarifying those boundaries. Right. But what happens then, that brings up a good question, if as the event planner, you're the one hiring those vendors. Because that, yeah. you know, I've had to do that many times for clients where the vendors are my responsibility. And if something goes wrong, it all comes down to me because they've hired me to hire those vendors. You know, yeah. it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes they have their own vendor, you know, they have a preferred vendor that they want to work with. And in that case, I get it. But uh, it, you have to, you have to just kind of see how that work plays out, I think, too. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I think if you're kind of like, you know, I think of it as like building a house, right? You have like a renovation, you have a general contractor and these, this person's responsible for all these different, 
you know, subcontractors, essentially, right? Yeah. You, you're kind of like the director and the coordinator. So then, then, you know, you're probably, there's some responsibility on your part to like maybe double checked or fixed it or whatnot. But, um, I think again, going back to it's communication, you can go back to them and say, you know, what is it that, you know, you weren't happy with? What can we do to fix it? Um, did I perform these services? Yes, I did. And just, you have to have that conversation and kind of sometimes walk people back from like a ledge. <laughs> right. right. And sometimes it is just a matter of listening and not saying anything when, if it does come down to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. If, you know, that conversation does happen. So let's just um, take a little bit of a turn, uh, still talking kind of about contracts and your legal rights. Uh, again, this is something else that comes up in our community a lot, and it's the copywriting of pictures and content. And, you know, there's a lot of people who take pictures at their events and then they use them as promotional tools on their website, their blog posts, social media, and then they find out that they're being used elsewhere and, and not credited for that um, information or those photos. Is there any way that you can copyright your photos or your content and protect yourself and your company? Okay, absolutely. So, um, it's probably a really that. big question, but it is, it is. And I do, you know, I do teach on this topic because I find that there are a lot of questions and confusion. Um, and I am only talking about U.S. copyright laws because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. Um, but essentially the concept of copyright, as you know, is this form of protection that's afforded by the laws of the United States. And it basically protects published or unpublished works of original authorship. So one question is to understand, okay, is this something that can be copyrighted? So in the context of photos and um, content, yes, it can. Um, it falls within the right categories. The second issue is who owns the copyright? Okay, so if you are an event planner and you're taking pictures of an event, um, it's like you're actually taking pictures, or let's say you have employed somebody and there is an agreement that um, if they're your employee and they're taking pictures, usually when someone is performing within the scope of their employment, any kind of content that they create belongs to the employer, so you the event planner. Or you can come up with an agreement with a photographer that those co I'm going to own the copyright to these images, right? So assuming you own the copyright to the images, um, another issue that often comes up is um, getting a release. So if you're going to be posting pictures of the bride and groom or if you're going to be posting pictures of the CEO of the company, you know, you want to make sure that you have a signed release from them, um, basically giving you permission to utilize those images um, for your business purposes. Uh, but then finally, to get to your question, how to protect your copyright. So assuming all of that's in place. Um, so a lot of people don't realize this, but you are granted copyright protection, at least under the laws of the United States, the moment that, a, um, that your work takes a tangible form. So it's, at the moment it's expressed in a tangible manner. So the moment it's on that digital uh, memory card, it's protected by copyright, okay? It's your creation. Uh, but there are obviously other steps you can do more formally protect it. One, you can include the copyright notice, which is that C in a circle, the date in which it was published, the name of the copyright owner. You could file um, for copyright um, protection with the, uh, um, on the, with the copyright office. You could do it online. It's not complicated and not that expensive. So those are the formal ways you can protect yourself. But in terms of the realistic ways in which we now operate in this world and just how everybody's sharing everything and they feel like, okay, if it's on the internet, it's free to take. Um, photos, <laughs> photos, one thing you could do is a lot of people will include metadata so that, you know, it has the name of the copyright owner should it ever be taken. Um, you can hopefully, like, trace it back. Uh, you could include a, like I said, a copyright notice um, on it, like a watermark. Uh, one thing to uh, include a content policy on their website or on their social media accounts saying, you know, um, do not use without written permission or um, if using, please credit. Um, there are ways in which you can do like searches to find if your images are being utilized. So there's Google image search. Um, there's some other different um, programs where you basically can do a reverse search and find, okay, is this person taking my content? Um, and, uh, same for, you know, websites and content itself. It's basically a balance of 
notifying the people, making it really obvious that this is something that is protected but under copyright. It's your copyright, right? Um, and uh, or your copyrighted work, and then like a policing a little bit. You know, unfortunately, I don't know of any way where you can, I don't know, get some sort of notice <laughs> that someone is using it. Um, other than kind of having your eyes and ears out there. Um, I think there is a website where at least with content, um, it'll give you a notice. Like it's almost like a, a Google, uh, notice, but it's not from Google where you get like some plagiarizing your content. Um, yeah. so you can track down websites like that and see. It's called, so um, it's a tint. balance. Yeah. It's called tint T Y N T. There may okay. be others, but that is one of them that uh, I actually use that one as well. Yeah. Okay. Does, what does that do? It, it just, just it. Um, so what it does is you have to put the code on your website. So you, if you have a developer, just get them to copy and paste the code into your website. And then it tracks any time that your content has been shared or used. Excuse me. And then each week it'll send you an update and it'll tell you which of those posts have been used, how many times. And then there's a bunch of other information that I don't recall um, yeah. that they send to you. Yeah. Yeah. So there are tools out there. I mean, I guess it's a really, you know, you have to think about your, you know, do I really care? How much energy do I put into tracking some, some of this kind of activity down right. um, against like, okay, it's going to happen, unfortunately. Um, and so long as, you know, maybe they credit the source, then I'm okay with it. Right. So. Right. And you, can, was, um, you can always contact people too, if you are okay with it, or sorry, if you're not okay with it, um, you know, just a simple season assist. Like this is my, just a nice email. This is my content. You know, it doesn't have to escalate into anything aggressive at the beginning um, and then just yeah. follow it from there. And, you know, I have a lot of people who will copy and paste information. I do have things on my website to prevent the copy and pasting. You have to share it now. Um, but I have contacted them and said, I'm really happy that you share my content. Thank you. But please credit me for it. Simple. Yeah. And I find that like, is fine. I find that the majority of like they want to do the right thing yeah. they just don't know the rules and Absolutely. they find that well everyone is doing it so I'm, I, I guess it's okay um and it's, it's it's a slippery slope and it's dangerous especially because there are those few people out there who will about it and will like contact you with a cease and desist letter from an attorney so again that's why it's really important like is this really like what do I do I really care from them you know, if I just want them to stop using it, or do I want them to just credit me? Do I want them to pay me for it? So thinking through those things about the different content that you create, so you're prepared when you do, should you find somebody utilizing your content without your permission, you know what to do. Yeah, I agree. And the thing is, you are you brought up a really great point, again, about most people don't know. And chances are, if you don't know what the rules are, they may not either. So just sending in a simple email saying, hey, I noticed you shared it. Would you mind crediting me or please take it down, whatever you're more comfortable with. Sometimes, That's you know, in many cases, having a credit on there is much more valuable to you because if other people see it, they'll come to your website and you might, you might get business out of it. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So and that's, that's a personal decision absolutely. for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is great. Um, so um, Annette and I would love to hear from you guys. If you have any questions about contracts, please um, make a comment in the... <laughs> I can't even get this together today. I'm going to skip that part and go to it at the end. I don't even know why I jumped in that. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> oh, I, love, I love editors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Annette, thank you so much. I know we could talk for hours and hours about contracts and the ins and outs and what we should and shouldn't have. And, you know, a lot of the time, um, you, you're going to have to customize your contract for your event or the types of events that you plan. So I would love to know, because I know you started your business, you were working for a law, a law, blah, blah. <laughs> my God, sorry. I'm not usually, it's usually okay. it's at the beginning this happens, not halfway through or twenty. I must be end. distracting you with my charming I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bright lights. I know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, okay, let me try that again. Okay. Um, so, Annette, thank you so much for all that information. I know that we could have a conversation about this for hours and hours, and it does depend on the type of events that you're planning. And, you know, you may have to customize every contract for every event. 
But let me just ask you um, a question about your business. And you went from working for a law firm and to running your own business. What's one thing that stopped you from getting started? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. And I've been actually thinking about that a lot lately. Um, I think entrepreneurship and running your own business is really a huge exercise in um, conditioning your mind <laughs> and conditioning your thoughts and kind of if you can master your own inner psychology, <laughs> um, it, that is your key to success in anything that you do. Um, I think a lot of what stopped me um, was my own thoughts and my own minds about my, my own mind about what I could and couldn't do and you know fear. Um, of putting yourself out there. So I think if you can just acknowledge that that fear is always going to be there, um, listen to it and just say, okay, I hear you, but I'm not going to like, I'm not going to do what you say and I'm just going to do this anyway. Yes. Um, that's, that's a huge uh, step in the right direction. I love that. Yeah, I think you're right. You're, you really just, you have to train your mind and realize yeah. that you can do it. You know, um, it brings up a good point. It's a little, not totally in topic here, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was listening to a live, well, actually it was a recorded webinar yesterday, and it was from a hypnotherapist who works with celebrities, and her simple strategy for working with her clients is to write down, even if it's on your mirror or a little sticky note, but just say, I am enough. And if you see that yeah. over and over and over again, and I think that happens a lot for entrepreneurs because you get this feeling that, what if I can't do it? What if I don't succeed? What if, what if, what if, what if? And it can become a vicious cycle in your brain. Oh my God, I could do like a whole webinar series on yes. that alone. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's I think it really like entrepreneurship and running your own business really forces, it makes you so vulnerable and it makes you like have to work through all of that and just just slowly like chip away at that and if you can get through to the other side and just like conquer that you're going to be that much better off it's it's very true you know i was uh, saying to a friend a couple of weeks ago we were talking about business and starting business a uh, business or businesses in his case and i just said to him like i feel like i've had more tears in the last three years than i've ever shed in my life and sometimes they're tears of joy and sometimes they're like i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> And you know what? It's so nice and refreshing to hear that because I think that sometimes like I know I've sat in on, you know, and I've, I've watched videos just like the one we're having right now. And I feel like, oh, my gosh, she looks like she has it all together. And, you know, like everything looks so great. But like the reality is like everybody goes through this and maybe they're not crying and eating bonbons like maybe you and I are. But like everybody has that. And I think the greatest successes come after like you've maybe experienced what you think is failure because it motivates you and you learn from it and you go to the next one. So yeah. I hear you. I've had my fair share of tears. I still have them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's part of the process. I think it is. Yeah. There's always a little bit of self doubt and sometimes it's a driving factor. At least it is. Yeah. Me. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I want to know that I can do this. Totally. Yeah. So thank you. For, thank you for sharing that. With us. Yeah. Um, I know there are a lot of people who are watching this who will resonate with that, uh, that fear factor. <laughs> so, um, just before we sign off, um, I do want to mention that I have some of Annette's contracts on my site, so I'm going to put a link below for you guys. There is um, an agreement for event or wedding planning services plus an independent contractor agreement. Um, so make sure you ch uh, click on that link and you can get access to those. And then just before we go, Annette, please share with us um, how we get in touch with you. Yeah, you can find me on my website, and it's my name, AnnetteStepanian.com, and that's A-N-N-E-T-T-E-S-T-E-P-A-N-I-A-N.com. Um, there's no H in my last name. Um, and if you go to the top right-hand corner, there's a button called Join, and you can get on my mailing list, and you'll get a uh, contract review checklist, and it's 17 things that I recommend that you look at before you sign a contract or send out a contract for um, review, and you'll also get an invitation to join my Facebook group. And I'm in there every day having conversations just like this with a bunch of creator, creatives from all over the world. That is great. I love the, that you mentioned the um, contract checklist. I think that is perfect for everyone watching this. So make sure you yeah. just head on over and see that. And then just before we sign off, um, Annette and I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions about contracts, uh, please share them in the comments below and we'll be sure to respond to you. And as always, thank you for joining us. Um, if you like this content and want to get more videos, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel at Event Planning Blueprint TV and make sure that you also get on over to eventplanningblueprint.com and sign up for a free weekly advice. Thanks everyone. And
and I hope you all have a fantastic day.